Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Future Proofing Manufacturing in the Supply Chain, brought to you by GIE Media's Aerospace Manufacturing and Design, Today's Motor Vehicles, and Today's Medical Developments, and sponsored by Hanover Mesa, IMTS, NTMA, and USCTI. I am Eric Brothers, Senior Editor for the Magazines and the Webinar Moderator. As destructive as the COVID-19 influenza pandemic has been to the industrial supply chain, it's simply the latest disruption manufacturers must face. Lisa Anderson, president of LMA Consulting Group Incorporated, will explain how manufacturing and supply chain executives can successfully learn how to navigate, emerge, and position companies to thrive post-pandemic. In this webinar, you will learn key insights and proactive approaches to consider across the end-to-end -end supply chain, as well as strategy and tactics across all organizational functions. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsors. Hanover Mesa Digital Days, held July 14th to 15th, is a virtual event for industrial transformation, offering panel discussions, networking, and innovation, innovation presentations from international experts in Industry 4.0, Artificial Intelligence, 5G, Logistics 4.0, Smart Energy, and more. Visit hanovermesa.de for more information. AMT, the Association for Manufacturing Technology. With more than 700 member companies, AMT represents the original equipment manufacturers and distributors of more than 70% of the manufactured technology products sold in the US. With the COVID-19 virus forcing cancellation of the live show IMTS in September, AMT is launching IMTS Spark, which will present a trove of new content, interviews, technical presentations, and networking opportunities. Look for more information in the weeks ahead. NTMA's mission is to help members of the US precision custom manufacturing industry achieve profitable growth and business success in a global economy through education, technology, networking, programs, and services. The United States Cutting Tool Institute, USCTI, works to represent, promote, and expand the U.S. cutting tool industry and to promote North American manufacturers and or remanufacturers of cutting tools, as well as tool surface treatment providers. A wide range of activities include a comprehensive statistics program, human resources surveys, scholarship program, and semi-annual meetings to share ideas and receive information on key industry trends. Now a few notes before we get started. You will have an opportunity to ask our expert questions at any time during the presentation. However, we will hold off on answering the questions until the end of the presentation. You may ask questions by typing them into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. Our presenter today is Lisa Anderson, founder and president of LMA Consulting Group, which specializes in manufacturing strategy and end-to-end -end supply chain transformation that maximizes customer experience while enabling profitable, scalable business growth. She is experienced in working with closely held, private equity-backed, and large complex organizations in industries ranging from aerospace and defense, building industrial products, to food and beverage. Frequently quoted in media such as the Wall Street Journal, ABC News, and others, she is regularly invited to speak at conferences and events on supply chain topics and has been named a top influencer among tech, enterprise resource planning, and business to business categories. Please welcome Lisa Anderson. Oh, thank you. So I'm excited today to talk a bit about future proofing your manufacturing operations and supply chain. So we'll just jump right in. All right, so we have clearly um, gone completely out of whack in terms of uh, our supply chain uh, alignment during COVID. So uh, certainly consumers started hoarding items like toilet paper, creating uh, crazy demand spikes. Uh, with that said though, um, We've we've seen this carry over. I continue to get calls uh, daily, really, from the media, trying to find out when when some of this uh, supply chain will uh, go back into alignment. Uh, and it's really not just consumers; it's also businesses. Uh, they've it depends on, of course, uh, which which industry 
uh, but there's a lot of misalignment out there. It's really unprecedented uh, to have the types of demand spikes that's been going on uh, and uh, drop-offs. So, uh, and, and many clients uh, are seeing both. Uh, so basically it's how to manage all this and how to manage you know, the different, uh, you know, uh, getting through uh, resupply uh, shocks from Asia, Asia, et cetera. So in essence, the bottom line here is, is that the wrong items are in the wrong places at the wrong time is really uh, where we stand um, overall. It's starting to get back into alignment, but there's also a lot of disruption and concerns going forward. So we'll talk more about all of this, but one of the things I'd like to point out is, is that the bullwhip effect or what's called the bullwhip effect is in full force and so what that really means is that a small increase or decrease in demand uh, at the uh, end user so it could be a consumer could be a patient in the hospital could be a uh, uh, just you know the business that you supply all of which have had crazy spikes up and down in this environment, but nevertheless, a small change by the time it gets through the extended supply chain, which is the simplistic picture I have on the screen, but once it gets through the extended supply chain, a small change looks dramatic by the, you know, your supplier, supplier, supplier. So, um, and we are by no means experiencing small changes in this environment. Uh, and uh, for, I uh, actually work with all three of the markets that we're talking about in terms of aerospace and uh, hospital products. And I also have done some with um, automotive and um, I've seen seen both uh, spikes and uh, drop-offs uh, depending upon which industry. So it's definitely creating havoc um, in our extended supply chain. So one of the things we really wanna do to um, reset here is whatever strategic plans we had in place we have to throw them out they're they're no longer valid as much as we love the fact that we put together these great plans they're just not gonna cut it anymore so we have to instead put together an immediate strategy and we don't need to spend hours and days um and weeks or months like we used to uh putting together strategy we just need to get um you know the key people together and think about this. So there's, you know, like I'm recommending three different timeframes here. So one is the immediate strategy, which probably most of us have already done, I'm assuming. And so, you know, there you're establishing priorities, assessing risks, you certainly have to start by prioritizing your employees and the, the uh, needs for health and safety and how to support your business during these times and understanding your customers and suppliers, et cetera. So that, that alone has been consuming uh, my clients and also uh, colleagues uh, for the last uh, several months. So that's been challenging. At the same time, though, really needs to go to a three-month strategy, which hopefully we're all doing already. Um, and so there we really need to think about what factors are really going to drive our business forward and who are our customers' customers and our suppliers' suppliers and, and what what is going to change about it. So we're uh, you know, I've, I've gone into a lot more detail on these slides in my ebook, which I'll talk about later in this uh, presentation because it's um, free for download. So if you want more information, feel free to do that. So with that said, I'm going to keep going. Uh, so you want to do the start, stop, continue, improve exercise. So it is as simple as it sounds. Uh, you know, what should I really stop doing today? That's actually the hardest question. I have a hard time answering that question because you know you you're so used to doing those things. What should you stop doing because we have a lot of things we have to start doing that we weren't doing before. So we have to have room in our schedules to do that. Um it, and, and unfortunately it's really just not the time to take a break. If anything everyone every executive that I talk to uh and I'm on some uh industry calls uh and uh CEO calls in um, the West Coast, but also throughout the country and actually globally as well. And the one thing that we that everyone has in common is, is that they are busier than ever. 
uh, not necessarily with business uh, as far as like new business or volume, but as far as managing the business and how what they're needing to do to, to move forward. And then uh, last but not least is the long-term strategy in today's world is really nine months. I mean, you know, you could, we could argue here between nine months and a year, but it's not going out years. We don't even know what's happening years from now. Uh, so, you know, how do we look at something that's a little bit longer term? Well, we need to be parallel pathing these three, these three areas, especially now. Um, so really here you start by uh, creating the expectations that after the immediate concerns are addressed, uh, there are exciting opportunities in the future. And we have to, we have to reorient uh, business, our business to that and figuring out what those are. They're, they're not always going to just pop out at you. So, um, you know, how can we, one thing that is absolutely certain is, is that the, po the folks who innovate, and you don't have to spend a fortune to innovate, but those who innovate will thrive on the other end. Uh, so it's, you're really quite worth it to figure that out and how we can reinvent our businesses as we need to, you know, thinking about reconfiguring, reorganizing, redesigning, retooling, uh, and considering different market needs, customers, products, et cetera. We're gonna talk a bit more about these. So I'm gonna talk about each of these priorities, but from an immediate nature, we want to be looking at these five priorities. So we'll go into each one here. From a talent point of view, uh, really the quote that I have listed here, we've yet to meet a client with happy customers and unhappy employees is absolutely still true. So it means that we have to at least start with our, start with our employees. We're need, you know, like generally speaking, you know, some of this you should be doing all along, um, regardless of whether or not we were in a COVID situation or not, obviously. But, uh, you know, keep the best. Sounds sounds uh, like obvious. However, I can tell you from my experience in working with uh, clients across multiple industries, it is not as easy as it sounds. And many times they end up losing the best because they're dealing with the mediocre. So how, find ways to keep the best, and that means keeping them involved and um, and innovating at the, at the in the current situation. We also need to be filling the gap in this case. So that that might mean hopefully we've been cross training and uh, looking at a lot of those concepts all along. But you know, really, we just have to jump into action and um, fill in roles that we didn't use to fill in. So uh, it's absolutely a great time to be sharpening the saw, meaning we need to look at where we should be strengthening uh, our, our employees and then what, you know, where should we be educating? How can we be getting, how can we be thinking about the future and what we can do to uh, be successful instead of solely survive? Because certainly we don't want to work double the F, double the time, which many, many of our clients are doing uh, to just survive. And it's actually an opportune time to acquire top talent. Uh, if you're thinking about this and you have a, a good view of the future, I, I actually have this client, it was pre-COVID, but I love to tell the story. And they, during the great recession, they, all their competitors were laying out everyone because that's of course what was happening. And uh, the CEO picked up uh, you know, an engineer at the bottom of the recession that he couldn't afford, you know, particularly, you know, certainly his business wasn't any better, uh, but he picked this and he had no idea what, what the, he would do with this engineer and it was sort of, sort of an R and D type engineer. Uh, but in essence, fast forward eight years later or something like that. And uh, they were number one in their market because they were, on top of what new products to be introducing and um, you know really came down to uh, the decisions he made and acquiring some top talent at a time when no one else wanted to because that person stuck around uh, or those people stuck around he actually acquired more than one uh, when everyone else started leaving uh, customers and channels so this is really quite critical so do you know your customer it sounds obvious that we should know our customers but what I have found is, is that it's maybe not as easy as, as we thought, because 
who are our customers' customers? Or who are our customers' customers' customers? Because each one of those folks may be having a very different reaction to what's happening and what's going on with their volume and the challenges they're facing. And if we don't know what's happening with our customers, 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 we'll have no chance of trying to figure out what's going on with our uh, with our future volume and the changing customer expectations. Same thing is true for our channels. And not all customers are created equal. So, uh, you know, uh, the, a lot of these concepts are truly evergreen, but it's a great time to start doing them because they're more important than ever during these uh, challenging times. Uh, reach out. I mean, it is amazing how how much success our clients have had when they reach out. And it's just simply meaning pick up the phone, uh, check in on their customers, check in on their suppliers, find out what's happening. Uh, they're, when they check in on employees, it sounds so obvious, but it's most of the time it's not done. And a simple uh, reach out can go a very long way. Uh, also, customers are changing needs. I think I have additional information about this in future slides here, but understanding our evolving customer needs is probably one of the most important things we could be doing right now because it's absolutely evolving. And if we were timely as to what was going on two months ago, normally that would be great. Right now it's terrible because it's, it means you're, you're like 10 years you know, behind the times. So, uh, and last but not least, you know, think about building your brand. By all means, it's a great time to be thinking about your product supply strategies. Uh, so what your, worked yesterday very well may not be working tomorrow. So should we be, you know, should we be, where should we produce? Should we even, should we make, should we buy? It's never a hundred percent one way or another. Um, I have found that, uh, you know, people jump on fads and bandwagons. Uh, so like, you know, several years ago when everybody was outsourcing to Asia, uh, you know, in the industries that they could, a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon and they found out it wasn't, even, didn't even make sense back then. So certainly doesn't make sense now. With that said, many times it made great sense. So it's a situation by situation um, evaluation and, you, and it's absolutely changing 100% as to what makes sense for you. That doesn't mean that it's 100% different, just means that it's changing. So you gotta figure out what the heck it means. Uh, so you, you know, should we make or buy? Should we source from um, Mexico? Should we source from um, Asia? Where should, we, where should we be sourcing from? And this could just be materials, it could be um, finished goods. Should we be, um, you know, as far as suppliers go, by all means, our suppliers, suppliers can have a huge impact on us. How strong are they really? Uh, so we really need to find out about, you know, our products by strategies and are they innovating? Are, you know, what, what's happening in our extended supply chain? Because we are very dependent on them and we've, it's all been going along fine up till now. It's changing dramatically. So we really got to find out what is happening and, and um, reevaluate what we're doing, but we cannot take months, even weeks to figure things out anymore. So we have to get right on top of uh, our financial or our, our product supply strategies. And that leads us to our financial strategies. We could be the great, have the greatest plans ever, but if we don't know where we stand from a financial strategies point of view, we are in deep trouble. Uh, you know, cash certainly is king. And if we don't have it, we're going to have a problem here. So how do we, uh, how do we make sure that we uh, have access to cash and that we can do what makes the most sense and is smart for our business? Because the last thing we'd want to do is be cornered into uh, doing um, things that really aren't smart at all, uh, just because we've backed ourselves into a corner. So, uh, you know, really understanding our future, our current and future cash positions and financial strength is going to depend on our customers and our suppliers. So 
back to that again, but how, how familiar are we really with what's going on here? Or are we just thinking that what's happened in the past will continue to happen in the future and we've got, we're feeling good about things because we've gotten on top of exactly what's going on at the moment? Well, it's no longer sufficient, unfortunately. We better figure out more than that and how, um, how reliable are they? Are we are our customers and our suppliers, and how how, how is that going to go? Uh, also, lots of companies turn off their capex uh, during these times. It's not surprising at all. However, should we? It's a very good question. Uh, I would advocate absolutely not. With that said, should we spend on what we were spending on before? Probably not. So again, let's reevaluate because putting money to something that will help us innovate and take a giant leap forward. More people succeed during crises and uh, dramatic change than any other time. So how do we, how do we take advantage of that? One might be investing in something that's going to help us do something we didn't even think we needed to do a month ago. So perhaps we even should be, canceling everything that we were doing before and then just starting over again and figuring it out. But it just depends, of course. Uh, so is it time to bunker down or invest? Certainly, you know, generally speaking, it depends. You know, uh, m many times you can be thinking, well, the, the regular reaction during the uh, Great Depression, during the Great Recession, during 9-11, during all these different, you know, significant events in our history, people have tended to bunker down. I mean, it's very tempting. And in this case, we have to bunker down to some degree because we were all stuck in our house. So, you know, what's what better than to bunker down in terms of financial strategies too? And to some degree, it certainly makes sense to be prudent about what you're spending, so otherwise you will run out of cash. However, similar to the, during the Great Depression, Kellogg and Post were just introducing cereal. And which is quite quite funny because of course now it's so commonplace. But they were just in, introducing cereal, and um, during that time, uh, you know, posted what everyone else did, and and uh, you know, cut back and you know, tried to cut costs and those kinds of things. And uh, and Kellogg instead did the opposite and uh, looked at you know how do I emphasize this this line right now? Maybe even invest into it. And, um, you know, like they were, they took that viewpoint and it was, they were wildly successful in terms of their growth and their bottom line and their uh, market share. So you don't necessarily have to invest large dollars. In some cases it may make sense, but uh, you don't necessarily have to invest much of anything in many ca cases, but it makes sense to take advantage of opportunities. And, uh, you know, there's many stories I could name that are similar to that. From a leadership standpoint, you know, if leaders were, leaders are always essential. Uh, you know, my uh, favorite, uh, well, I should say my most uh, significant uh, benefit in my career prior to consulting was uh, an HR mentor I had who, who was a, former P&G employee, because we had purchased a division of P&G at the company that I uh, led. And so she actually, she worked for me, but uh, she was excellent at OD. And I learned more from her than I can, you know, I would never be able to do what I do today without her um, expertise. And she always said, you know, it begins and end with, ends with leadership. And that is absolutely true. Uh, if you think about it, who do your employees follow? And who do they stay for? They don't stay because they, because you pay them. They, even if you pay them well, they're not, it's not, they're not staying for that reason. They stay for their leaders. So uh, leaders are quite, quite key. So, you know, you can read some of these uh, pieces here, but one of the ones that I'll call out, I'm going to call out again, but, you know, engage people in the future. You know, like people are going to be worried, understandably, we all are. Uh, and so how do we get, how do we start thinking about something productive that'll move us forward, figuring out how we'll, how we'll do that in a good way as we think about the future in a positive way. Um, now, that doesn't mean we put our bury our head in the sand. We have to be thinking about, um, of course you have to be thinking about what's 
what are the risks that could happen, those kinds of things. But we certainly need to be thinking about the future. And the other thing that I would point out on this slide is uh, Newton's law of motion. So what I mean by that is, you know, objects that are in motion stay in motion and objects that are rest stay at rest. So it unfortunately bunkering down and stopping is the worst thing we can do. So now it doesn't necessarily mean, obviously we have to work from home, you know, in certain cases and that kind of thing, but we absolutely need to keep moving forward. Even if it's just a little bit forward, it's just so much easier to get started if you are already in motion than if you are at a dead standstill. Uh, you know, I actually I can uh, share a story between after I, uh, you know, worked for this, this company was a vice president of uh, operations and supply chain. We um, found private equity backers, um, you know, combined three businesses into one relaunched product lines and sold off the business for profit. It was like this 24-7 uh, crazy experience. It was it was awesome though. It was, it's how I uh, gained great experience to be able to uh, get started in consulting 15 years ago. Uh, however, I was you know traveling quite a bit during those days uh, to different facilities and suppliers and customers, et cetera. And then uh, as I was starting my consulting business, you know, I was putting things together and then I found a client that was in the area and, you know, I really wasn't traveling a lot. Uh, and so I went on my first trip with my uh, client. They wanted me to go visit Wichita, Kansas, of all places. So I went to Wichita, Kansas, this is aerospace related. And uh, my gosh, I have never been that tired in my life. From a from a simple trip to Wichita, Kansas. So, objects in motion stay in motion. I was by no means in motion. I was moving forward like conceptually, but I was not in motion as far as uh, traveling anyway. So you know that simple example is amplified uh, for businesses. So key go forward business concepts. We have agility. By all means, the companies that are agile right now are going to be much more successful. And if you if you hadn't been on the idea on the um, track of agility, there's no reason to no reason to give up. You can always create agility. It's more of a culture change and a concept. Collaboration is by no means a fluffy concept anymore. Those people who are successful uh, work together, uh, and they're working with some uh, different partners than than they ever have before, including competitors. Uh, alignment between demand and supply, uh, just alignment of people, different functions uh, is, is absolutely essential right now. Uh, innovation, I've talked about that, and speed. What used to take six months is taking six days, six weeks, or maybe six hours. So uh, we uh, need to be thinking about quick, you know, how quick we are, because it's definitely going to uh, um, relate to how successful we are. So we'll go through quickly on some highlights by function that we should be thinking about. HR and safety, we probably all have done this, so I'm going to go through this really quickly. But I would leave you with the thought of consider whether you are attractive to your current and future employees. I mean, that's really the bottom line here. Obviously, you have to keep people safe and healthy. And, you know, it's you know, this has been pretty traumatic. So we have to be thinking about how we can support our employees and how we can, um, you know, support ourselves from a compliance standpoint. Uh, and certainly remote is a whole new, whole new slash not new uh, thing that needs to be managed. But really, how, how attractive are we to our employees? From a sales and business development standpoint, should we serve all customers? I will tell you that our clients that are prioritizing and really understanding where their strengths are and where their future customers are, are much more successful than the rest. You cannot serve everyone equally. So it's how do you choose to allocate your limited resources? So be really thinking about that. Um, well, these days you can pick up the phone. That is a great way to get in touch with people because we certainly aren't visiting many of them in person. Just got off a, a webinar with a group of CEOs and we were talking about just this topic. 
how do we do this in the era of no trade shows or limited, you know, limited ability to visit customers? So uh, we really need to be picking up the phone and getting in touch with them. And, and we can do quite a bit via uh, webinars and Zoom and those kinds of things. Uh, no, no company is going to succeed if their customers cannot stay viable. So when you pick up the phone, find out how you can help. It's really as simple as that. Uh, relationships are on the move. During times of crisis like this, they are on the move more than ever before. Meaning, if you are the, an attractive company to customers, just like employees, they're going to be flock to you down the line. Uh, and so I would, you know, ask that question because who wouldn't like more of your ideal customers to be coming your way? And then the forever transaction, that is a concept related to the membership economy, but it has, and it has great, uh, um, you know, impacts regardless of your industry. So like, in all of the industries covered in today's webinar, there are ways we can, and I could talk about this for like another hour, but there, if you think about it, will your customers come back to you if they have to renew? Most of the time in our industries, um, they don't necessarily, they, they, well, they might, they might be able to choose in healthcare, they may not. Uh, so if you're, let's just say, if your customers could choose and they were to renew, would they renew with you? Would they even think about it or would it just be like, of course? That's really the question. How do you make it so that your customers are like, not only uh, not only do they keep coming back, but they don't even think about it. That's really what you wanna think about here is how do you make that happen? Uh, from a customer service standpoint, oh my gosh, are we really busy? Because Change consumer behaviors are absolutely evolving. So that's for sure affecting uh, the automotive industry. It's affecting healthcare. It's affecting food and beverage. It's affecting lots of industries. So consumer behaviors are changing, which means that our products, our services, the way we, uh, the way we uh, talk with customers has to change. So it's not just consumer behaviors, however, it's also business buying behaviors. So for example, lots of people are, from a consumer standpoint, people are ordering fewer items, but they're ordering, like one of, one of our clients uh, supports, uh, well, business, businesses and consumers. And what they have seen is, is that their volume is, I would say like largely even, maybe even slightly down uh, overall in terms of dollars, but the but they have pretty much doubled the number of orders, which basically means that the quantities have gone down. So it's uh, per order. So that's that's a very different situation to handle than one where where they were a month ago. So you know things are changing pretty rapidly. Are you thinking about? what you're going to do and differentiated service how are you going to provide differentiated service there's a lot of ways and i'm happy to you know to answer some questions if you have them on these topics and i provide examples of course in further in the ebook but uh just basically be thinking about customer success instead of customer service of course you have to be serving your customers in terms of on-time deliveries and those types of things which are essential but just on-time delivery or on-time in full um, is relevant, but what's even more relevant is customer success. Will your customer be able to continue to grow? If your customer is growing, it's likely, especially if you're helping them grow, that you're going to grow too. So uh, it's worth thinking about. Um, from a supplier point of view, this is actually quite extremely critical right now because a lot of us have assumed incorrectly that our suppliers are great because they always were great in the past well that doesn't mean anything are they are they able to keep up in these in this new environments well it depends who are their suppliers are they go, are they doing well are they able to pay their bills what's happening so uh you know like for example right now uh the 
experts in uh, Asia are saying, make sure, try not to provide too much cash up front because the small and medium sized businesses are really struggling um, from a cash point of view. So you might, you might not see your product or your money back. So, uh, you know, how, who are your supplier suppliers? What kind of risks exist? And not all suppliers are created equal, but also not all materials are created equal. Do you have backups in place? Are those backups in name only? Or are they actually, are you actually purchasing something from your backups on an ongoing basis so that they, you know that they're, they're uh, available when you need them? So, you know, who, there's a lot of things to think about, but really reassess your risks and make sure that you're looking at your essential materials, those that don't have a backup, let's say. Um, you know, there's, there's a, sensitive materials so there's it depends on you know there's there's a lot of ways to look at this uh but basically be rem just remember that not all things are created equal here so what's important to you is that's really the question um and are you a customer of choice because let's say your supplier is uh you know struggling right now they won't be forever so you gotta keep thinking about that from a trade and global logistics point of view there is a whole lot of things going on and in essence, you really just need to be informed. The situation changes all the time. And you need to be aware that the whole network is out of balance, largely speaking. And how might that impact you? Because everyone is impacted to some degree by the global network, even if you are, you know, largely locally uh, supported. So it's really important to be thinking about that. Um, on manufacturing and supply chain operations, you know, there's, it really goes back to a lot of the concepts we've been talking about of people first and involving the front lines and agility, same kind of concepts. People are robots is coming up because after all, if you think about social distancing, if you can automate some pieces so that you can have uh, the clients that are able to have employees working further apart are obviously having an easier time handling social distancing type procedures. And um, certainly machines aren't getting COVID. Um, with that said though, it's not, automation isn't all that it's cracked up to be. You need to have a, um, a dual approach, a hybrid thinking uh, from this whole uh, thing, because uh, sometimes automation can actually be worse than anything else because you have this like pile up of things at the end of the line when, uh, you know, that famous, uh, Lucy and Ethel show does happen where, uh, you know, you, you just can't keep up because everything has gone awry with all this automation. So as I said earlier, innovation is the key during these times, during these uh, periods of time. So I would just say we have to start encouraging failure, which seems so wrong in, in some ways because of you know our past education systems no, nobody supports failure really but that's what innovation requires is to it requires failure and so or it requires the uh, like, well let's put it this way no one really invents something new and it doesn't have to be completely new it can just be a new combination of uh, you know of uh, could be repackaging doing anything that's like a um, with a basis, uh, even from the past. No one does that um, without making mistakes. So we have to be able to encourage failure within a reasonable like uh, framework. So we want to we want to keep them within, keep our employees like within guidelines that won't be detrimental, if you will. But then we don't want to be beating them up because of course, when are you going to fail at month end, at quarter end? Exactly when you don't want to fail, that's when you're going to fail. So, and R and D is basically some very, you know, it is a element of innovation. Typically speaking, failure is more expected. Certainly in pharmaceuticals and those kinds of industries, you expect that. But, um, you know, are we really investing in those in these areas right now? IT and technology is quite important. So there is a um, does technology have a seat at the table? Uh, right now, technology is increasing pace just like everything else. So this Inland Empire Brookings study is an example where, in essence, this region of California 
is expected to have uh, more, uh, you know, we're going to lose jobs to automation if we aren't innovating. And so we uh, need to um, do the, uh, uh, to automate. And they were expecting to do it on a, on a path that was like 10 years. And like everything else, that 10 years has been cut into like one year as far as what really is needed in today's environment. So we really need to be thinking about um, technology and what we're doing. But that's to say, we don't wanna just do technology for technology's sake. Uh, following the latest fad is the worst possible thing we can do. So what really makes sense in the business is really what to be thinking about. And it all doesn't have to cost money. Uh, the MacGyver approach works quite well in many cases, although, you know, it's funny. I get feedback from from a, a lot of these things sometimes, and it's uh, what I would say is it's never one way or another. It's never throw all your money into the latest technology. It's never use only the MacGyver approach and never spend a dollar. You know, it's make a good decision, but don't take you know 18 years to figure that out. Whatever the decision is, get the right group of people together stay informed and move on. From a finance and accounting standpoint, more critical than ever, just because your extended supply chain is going to provide you with challenges during this period of time. We need to be thinking about our uh, uh, financial position and, and proactively. So we need to be seeing them as a financial partner. Demand and supply is an unprecedented issue. So how do we align our demand and supply? It's one of the keys right now. And it's I talked about the bullwhip effect previously. So one of the things that is extremely popular is a concept called sales inventory operations planning, PSYOP, or sales and operations planning. Now, most clients don't really know what that necessarily means. It depends, you know, on their size and and uh, you know, like the industry, et cetera. However, that concept of how do we better align our demand? How do we create a predictable demand plan? That's a really key question that a lot of clients are, are figuring out right now. And that, that we get that solved, it, there's a whole lot to be gained if you can then also proactively align your supply meaning your manufacturing, your uh, warehousing, your make versus buy decisions, your supplier base, et cetera, your financial position. How do we align all of this so that we can have a successful path going forward? So that's, that's really a key question. And I would, um, no matter the industry, it's a great topic to focus on right now. And so and this is what I just said. So PSYOP, as I was talking about, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but it in essence fits in the middle between your demand and all the different sources of kind of demand that I'm showing on the left-hand side of the screen. And how do you know? What is your manufacturing plan, assembly plan, purchasing plan? You know, How do we put all that together so that you can have a predictable revenue plan and a predictable uh, profit? Uh, or predictable um, p l in essence. And actually, in this environment, more than ever, predictable balance sheet, right? Because we want to make sure we know where the cash is. So proactively managing demand goes back to understanding our customers' customers, understanding your markets, talking with your customers. I mean, some of these things sound so apparent. It's funny, though, that, um, or maybe funny is not the right word, it's uh, interesting that it's the number one thing we can that clients across the board and colleagues across the board can do that they aren't really doing now. And it's because many times we just don't have the time and we're just not thinking about it. So how do we, we got to proactively manage demand and we will uh, be much better off for that. Now this, this is, does not mean that we shouldn't also follow lean principles. I see them going hand in hand and I've seen the most successful people putting them hand in hand. So what that means is from a lean standpoint, you wanna get further into your supply chain and understand the true demand. 
and uh, be so agile and aligned that you can um, be successful in um, uh, you know, going with them. So in this environment, by all means, there's no such thing as steady demand. So that you have to throw out the window. But the, the most, uh, the, the best practices still make a lot of sense. So proactively manage your demand, just to give you with a, a couple of insights here, why would you want to do this? Well, one is, is that for every 1% improvement in forecast accuracy, which is not a lot if you think about it, you can, you know, the statistics show, of course, it depends on your industry. Of course, it depends on where you stand. Of course, it depends on lots of things. But 7% reduction in finished good inventory or 9% reduction in inventory obsolescence are not numbers to be um, ignored. And a 3% increase in forecast accuracy, which also is quite doable, uh, means a 2% increase in margins. Holy cow, that's huge. And, you know, I've seen this come through in many clients um, once we get uh it's not just the proactive management of demand, but that's where you start because then you also align supply. So in aligning supply, you really need to understand your, uh, your um, let's see. Hmm. So you, hold on here. I got to see if my, uh, okay. So you uh, want to know your manufacturing capacity, understand your supply base. You want to be talking with your suppliers. Uh, taking your transportation network into account, uh, considering warehousing and storage capacities, all of these types of things that we've been talking about is important. Uh, let's see. Uh, I want to make sure, can, can, you, can, you, uh, can you see that I've changed my slide and it's showing proactive management of inventory just to make sure that we're, that you're still able to see? Well, while you're, uh, oh, go ahead. You still have the uh, proactive management of demand slide up. Oh, you do. Okay. So I need to figure out how to like get rid of my other window here. Hmm. Okay. Just hold on a second. Wow. Wow. All right, so you, you can see me again, I hope. All right, proactive management of inventory. So once you manage your demand and your supply, you can, you're, you're going to be proactively managing your inventory. Is all inventory bad? The answer is no. But should you go in the other direction and have stockpiles of inventory everywhere to improve your customer performance? Also, the answer is no. <laughs> it makes sense to be keeping strategic inventory to or and or strategic capacity. It really goes back to looking at your complete supply chain and your strategy and making smart decisions. The whole point of inventory is it covers a mismatch in demand and supply. So from that definition alone, it means that you need to have be thinking about strategic inventory, but it also means that if you aren't paying attention to your customers changing buying behaviors, you'll have all of the wrong inventory available, which is not good. Uh, so it also aligns the functions in your organization, as I was saying. You're really focusing in on the middle level, so you're not talking about part numbers with SIOP, you're really talking about models or product families, product lines, so you can reduce the risk and you can uh, improve your predictability and flexibility, which who wouldn't want in today's uh, environment? So that's really what this is about. I go into more detail in the ebook, but it's also, there's tons of articles uh, on my website on this topic because it's um, such a key uh, point right now. Uh, from a rolling monthly cadence, the idea with something like this is that you're in essence, building a typically 12 to 18 month in aerospace, you might go longer because you have contracts out sometimes two and three years, but you basically do a rolling monthly look at your demand and then and your supply and you make and you talk about key decisions. Do we have to redo everything every month? Absolutely not. We're talking about differences and key differentiators. But the reason you might want to look at this, and especially now, is, is that these are the types of savings you can achieve and the growth. So sales growth, 2 to 4%, and, you know, you can read the slide here. But in essence, improve margins, increase cash, 
and increase customer satisfaction. What's not to like about that? Of course, it's never as easy as just like, um, you know, you, it's a culture change. So trends going forward, as I mentioned, innovation, collaboration, being rapid, being quick, speedy, whatever you want to call it. Throw out best practices and focus on immediate value. That sounds, you know, crazy, uh, perhaps, but it's not. Really, people get so racked up in these best practices that um, they just do things in the name of best practices that don't make any sense at all. So what is a best practice for your situation and for your environment, which also includes where you stand right now? Now, that best practice is a good one to follow. And then, of course, being remote, virtual, great idea to uh, make sure that you are as effective as you can possibly be from a sales point of view, from a communicating with employees, et cetera. Changing customer needs, I've talked about that quite a bit because I think it's quite critical. So uh, changing customer needs, essential, just essential. There's, if there's one thing you take away, I hope that that's it. Uh, your immediate strategy, we talked about that. You know, the attractiveness of critical industries is is on the rise. So that's really good news to everybody on this call because we're in essence in several critical industries here. Uh, but that's something to be taken into consideration. How do we um, how do we take advantage of that opportunity or and in what risks might it uh, might it entail? Because people might leave us for something that seems more attractive. Um, Local manufacturing is certainly becoming a trend. I mean, I've received, uh, I've been on Bloomberg in the last month. I've received calls from, I can't tell you how many different um, people on this topic of reshoring. Generally speaking, it's going to make a whole lot more sense to put uh, your ability to supply ever changing and evolving customer needs close to customers. So that tends to mean more local manufacturing. Does it always mean that? Absolutely not. So in some cases, it means that um, you should be sourcing in Vietnam or who knows where. But basically keeping this, understanding your situation and addressing it is really quite um, important. And then we've talked about digitization and industry 4.0. Several of these concepts are quite integral to where we should be going in the future. But again, don't just jump on a bandwagon. Recent, uh, recipe for restart success, which we're going to be in this restart mode for probably a year until like a vaccine is widely, um, widely uh, available. So keep Newton's law in, in mind about um, objects in motion staying in motion uh, and trying to find ways to keep things moving forward that are critical. So now, should we keep things moving forward that, you know, are something we were doing in the past, even metrics we were tracking in the past that are they needed today? I don't know, probably not, actually. We have to stop doing something. Uh, so you cannot coast uphill. So this is another really key concept. I mean, it sounds really obvious, but I can tell you what, it's quite easy to get when you're so exhausted from all this, you finally get to a better position and you're like, you know what, I'm going to coast for a while. But the thing is, is that coasting pretty much means you're going downhill. So uh, you have to keep that in mind and make sure you're doing something to move forward. Relationships are moving faster. We talked a bit about that. Uh, applied creativity is really quite similar to in it's you know in essence innovation if you just think about it as applied creativity it doesn't sound so hard and taking control of the dial so you're not going to you have to be in control of your restart uh how do you start in a successful way so you can keep your customers happy and your supply base in alignment those types of things so we have to be so that's really the the keys for a restart recipe as i said we have a um uh an ebook with a lot more information and really some key points here. This is a, um, a link for a free download. Um, yeah, and I welcome you to send any questions. Uh, well, I mean, I'll answer them now, but I'm also, I also welcome you to send any uh, questions and I'll be happy to, uh, to answer them uh, following the webinar. So do you have any questions that you'd like uh, that you've received so far?
Well, <clears throat> thank you, Lisa, for that excellent overview of future-proofing uh, manufacturing in the supply chain, especially in light of uh, COVID-19. I have a couple questions. Um, you talked about um, obtaining transparency from your customers, customers, and your supplier, suppliers. Uh, how do you uh, open that dialogue? Is, is there some, uh, there's probably no magic formula, of course, but are there some guidelines to help ease uh, your way through that awkwardness? Uh, sure. So, so I'm working with a couple of clients right now on this topic. Uh, and, you know, the, the nice thing is, to some degree, it is as simple as getting on the phone. So in one, it depends on your organization and who's typically communicating with customers. But we were working with the customer service uh, folks and the sales folks and just simply establishing more frequent check-ins. So we, for one, we're like, if we used to talk to them quarterly, we might be talking to them monthly or even weekly right now. and asking questions like um you know hopefully we know something about our customers to begin with as far as who they're supplying but you know ask probing for more questions you know what is how are your customers uh you know is there any way we can help you that will also um help your customers or what are your customers experiencing that are that's um uh that's uh, creating challenges for them. And is, is there anything that, you know, we can do to help? You know, many times if you take that approach of uh, how can you provide value uh, up and down your supply chain, not only will you be able to help, which would be helpful to you as well, but you also learn a lot more about what's happening in your supply chain. So really it's, it truly is as simple as phone calls. Now it depends in certain industries, um, like I worked in healthcare as well, um, depends of course on, you know, there's so many aspects of healthcare, but, uh, you know, in, in we were supplying products to, um, distributors that supplied to hospitals and uh, at home. And, uh, there was more technology available, uh, than, in, than like in aerospace, cause there's fewer products, typically speaking in aerospace. And so, in that case, getting access to the data of what's happening further in your supply chain because it's already available, if in some cases, just looking at that data on a, you know, if you used to look at it monthly, because that would be normal, um, if you're looking at it from a forecasting point of view, or maybe you're doing, you're supplying your customers with what they need when they need it at all their locations. So you're doing vendor managed inventory for them. Uh, in that case, you might have been looking at it weekly. Well, doing it more frequently um, would be uh, the way to go. So, I, so I guess the the answer there would be use a combination of technology if it's available, and the old tried and true. <laughs> Pick up the phone, and uh, and um, you know between those two, it it can it can be uh, work really well to just figure out what's happening in your supply chain. Okay, Lisa, we've had a couple of requests for you to back up a slide for the uh, your ebook, if you could uh, oh, sure. accommodate on that. And um, thank you. Um, you talked briefly about enterprise resource um, uh, management, ERP software. Yep. Is that helpful on, um, especially for smaller companies? Is there something that will help them uh, supercharge their uh, SIOP? Um, that well so um so so i do actually i have quite a bit of experience with erp uh i would absolutely say that a base modern erp system will it's going to give you the 80 20 to manage during these times which which is quite important although i have to say also many clients come and say you know i think my systems are all you know something's all screwed up here uh can you help us select a new one and maybe even half the time they could do quite a bit more with the system they already have to be successful um, and so they don't necessarily need to like jump to an upgrade uh, so many times it's just Relooking at what you already, the tools you already have available, and seeing how to further optimize it and further utilize them. But then there are, especially in the smaller arena, um, you do get maxed out, and some of the functionality 
that are going to be included in more of the, you know, like the modern systems, I would call them, uh, can be essential. Like CRM in these times can be very helpful. Uh, certainly e-commerce type portals depends on your business, but, you know, like an e-commerce portal is not just for um, e-commerce. It actually is for B2B as well. And uh, I've had many uh, distributors, dealers, um, different folks like that utilizing portals. So, so I think that a base ERP system can make a lot of sense. And then in, depending upon your industry, adding some additional technology like, uh, like forecasting software. So there's nothing really that I would recommend for PSYOP. PSYOP is more of a culture change, a process, and you utilize data from your ERP system uh, for that. From a forecasting point of view, it depends completely on your industry. I've worked with clients. We've developed a forecast model in Excel that is more than sufficient to align their demand and supply. And in other cases, I have been like the first person in line at the board of directors meeting saying, we absolutely must have a uh, forecasting system that can support us. And there are some really good forecasting systems out there that are that are really low cost. So it really just, it really does depend, but I would say out of all the functionality, the forecasting functionality could help, but don't defer just to that because then you've lost your ability to think and provide input to it. All right, I see we're running uh, short on time here, but I wanted to ask you one final question. If you had to choose one priority for the next 90 days, what would it be? I would say that uh, getting a handle on, uh, let's assume that you've already, um, that you've been taking good care of your employees. With that assumption, I would say get proactively, manage your demand, get on top of your customers, find out how you can provide value and understand your changing and evolving buying patterns. That'll be the 80-20 uh, for your success. Thank you. A lot of great suggestions, Lisa. I appreciate it. Um, thank you. And I also thank our attendees. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors for today's webinar. That would be Hanover Mesa Digital Days, July 14th to 15th, a virtual event for industrial transformation, offering panel discussions, networking, and innovation presentations from international experts in Industry 4.0, Artificial Intelligence, 5G, Logistics 4.0, Smart Energy, and more. Visit HanoverMesa.de for more information. AMT, the Association for Manufacturing Technology. With more than 700 member companies, AMT represents the OEMs and distributors of more than 70% of the manufacturing technology products sold in the U.S. With the COVID-19 virus forcing cancellation of the live show IMTS in September, AMT is launching IMTS Spark, which will present a trove of new content, interviews, technical presentations, and networking opportunities. Look for more information in the weeks ahead. NTMA's mission is to help members of the U.S. precision custom manufacturing industry achieve profitable growth and business success in a global economy through education, technology, networking, programs, and services. The United States Cutting Tool Institute, USCTI, works to represent, promote, and expand the U.S. cutting tool industry and to promote North American manufacturers and or remanufacturers of cutting tools and tool surface treatment. Activities include a comprehensive statistics program, human resources surveys, scholarship program, and semi-annual meetings to share ideas and receive information on key industry trends. Thank you attendees for your excellent questions and attention. And uh, please note this webinar will soon be available on demand on our website, aerospacemanufacturinganddesign.com. And be sure to sign up for our upcoming webinars, Virtual Cutting Tool Roundtable, featuring a panel of experts who will discuss trends and answer your questions concerning cutting tool technologies. That's Thursday, July 16th from noon until 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And Location Intelligence Across the Manufacturing Plant, sponsored by Ubisense, Monday, July 27th from 11 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time. Location intelligence solutions have been in high demand as manufacturers get back to work by helping monitor worker movement. However, the primary purpose of these solutions has been to maximize throughput and reduce errors through digitization. 
attend our webinar to learn more. If you have any comments or suggestions, please email them to me at dbrothers at gie.net. On behalf of GIE Media's Manufacturing Group, I wish you a good day and goodbye for now.